Okay, we're on isomorphic substitution. We got a new tape in there, we're rolling. Okay, um, in addition to the uh, okay, tetrahedral and octahedral sheets, here's our octahedral sheet. Usually what happens is the parent material on an octahedral sheet is magnesium originally. Get to the point where microbes don't want to break it down, they leave the magnesium alone. That magnesium will bond with uh, hydroxide, which is OH, or oxygen can bond with hydrogen, OH molecule. And so we have our magnesium in the middle and the OH around. And these are going to be the sheeting on the inside of the clay. So on the outside wall of the clay, we have our tetrahedral. These are like the walls of it. And then the stuff that's on the inside is going to be these, this uh, octahedral sheet on the inside, as it indicates here. Okay? There's O and, and uh, SI right here. There's an O plane. There's oxygen up here bonded with SI down here. And then that bottom O comes together with this oxygen, aluminum, magnesium bond together, it's kind of sandwiched together. Okay, so that's the construction of one sheet of, of the clay. One sheet after the next, they all look like this. Okay, did I confuse anybody there? Are we all on the same page that each little sliver, and I'm looking at one little sliver of clay in that S SEM image, one sheet, looking down it, and what is it? Beta, we have the walls on the outside, tetrahedral, octahedral configuration in the middle. Silicon on the outside, usually magnesium in the middle. You're saying magnesium in the middle for the octahedron, but it says aluminum there. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. okay. Clay tetrahedral is typically silicon ion surrounded by four oxygen ion, ions, uh, or atoms. Uh, clay octahedral is typically aluminum surrounded by six bonded hydrogen and oxygen <coughs> atoms. Typically it is aluminum, but it starts off as magnesium. Mm -hmm. And this is where isomorphic substitution comes in. We're getting to that. Here we go. The process in which one element takes the place of another element of similar radii. Element size, the actual size of the atom. Magnesium is in the middle of this uh, octahedral sheet, right? As I just mentioned. And aluminum 3 plus is floating around in the soil solution. It buzzes right up next to this tetrahedral and octahedral sheeting configuration. It notices that Mg, magnesium being the original parent material, is a 2 plus ion recognizes that and says, hey, I'm stronger than you, and boots that magnesium out of the clay particle, or out of the clay lattice, the sheeting, and takes its place because it's three plus, it's stronger, it's a bigger dude, but it also has to have the similar radii, and I'll get to that in one second, just remember that. Isomorphic substitution, if there is aluminum in here, like here, silica can come by and kick it out. Only happens in silicon-rich soils. Quartz-rich. What about bamboo? Bamboo? <laughs> what is that? That's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of silica in it, right, right, right. Um, but that's all taken out of the soil, right? I mean, it's, it's taken from one place, making the soil a negative. You add it back in, yeah, it's going to add some. But we're talking, in granite soils, the amount of silica in here is just, oh, it's an amazing amount of number. It's the dominant um, parent material that's in there. What is the value of silicon? Well, aluminum is toxic. What is silicon? Silicon is a it's really a beneficial element uh, for plants. I actually put silicon um, amendment in my hydroponic system because the hydroponic system doesn't have rocks in it. No. So I actually take a soluble form of silicon and I'll put it in the hydroponic system. In biodynamics, they use 
crush quartz is, is a foliar spray mm -hmm. it increases the ability of the plant to absorb so it kind of uh, what absorb light oh yeah mm -hmm. the photosynthesis Usually most of the silicon is absorbed during the development stage of the plant, during like the seed stage, and it's really enough for it to last the most of the life of the plant. Okay, so we all know that magnesium originally starts off there, and then because aluminum is a 3 plus ion, it can come on and kick off the 2 plus guy. Right? These are facts. Well, it also has to have a similar radii, right? If a two, magnesium 2 plus ion substitutes for a three, L, aluminum 3 plus ion, there is a ch uh, change in the net charge. We'll get to the radii in a second. Just hold that in the back of your mind. But for right now, know that if in that lattice, magnesium's there, and then all of a sudden aluminum comes in, what happens to the, to the charge? It's going to have a stronger attraction to a negative, or a stronger negative attraction, right? Attraction to a, ne uh, a negative. There will be insufficient positive charge to balance off the negative charges from the oxygens. That's where the negative charge of clay comes from. After isomorphic substitution, because of the addition of the extra plus on the aluminum, makes the overall charge of the clay a negative charge. Does that make sense? No. You're okay. saying, but wouldn't the aluminum having the three be stronger and substitute the magnesium? But why would it have the other one? Wouldn't it? The, the three being stronger than the two, yeah. it'll kick it out. Yeah. Okay? Then, now there's one there's a stronger charge, right? It went from a two to a three positive charge. That means it has a stronger attraction to a negative ion. Just the way that's written, it looks like the yeah. two oh. substituted the three, yeah. but it's, yeah. it's the other way around. Yeah. Oh, is that, yeah, C substitutes, for, oh yeah, sorry about that. Switch them and that makes more sense. Yeah. I do apologize, <laughs> typo. Sorry about that. Everybody got that? So you have a stronger positive charge with aluminum in there, and then that attracts more negative. Stronger negative charge because the aluminum is positive. It needs a, a negative to, to balance it out. So two being this strong, and then aluminum being this strong, on the negative side, it, magnesium needs a, a two that's on the negative side to meet match this. Aluminum's going to need something that matches this, right? Does that make sense? Maybe we need a diagram. I need a diagram. So you need a positive three, balance it out? What's positive three? Negative three. Negative three. Negative three. Negative three. Negative three. How do I do a diagram? Just trying to think about writing a diagram. Seems like it should be a Okay. If Mg2 plus goes to Al3 plus, Mg2 plus is going to attract two minuses, whatever, whatever the letter is, two minus. This is going to attract three minus. So it now has a stronger negative charge. Because it's not just a loop of what's coming in, it's also three negatively charged particles it's attracting. Yeah, that's all really that matters. Forget it that it's aluminum. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's a three plus. Mm -hmm. And so for it's three minus is in Where there was two. So there was this amount of charge originally. Now it's one third stronger. Not really mathematically, but it's stronger because there is more there's a higher ionic number on the aluminum. Maybe you have to have a matching charge on the other side. So a clay with a magnesium center, or the, the lattice with a magnesium center, is still neg negatively, char or negatively charged, right? And then this is just going to make it more negatively charged. It sounds kind of back to front. It sounds back to front, but you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So, aluminum. Clay will attract more hydrogen 
Correct. Rating at higher pH. No, lower, 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 lower pH. pH. Lower pH. Correct. <laughs> higher acidity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Should I move on? Yes. Okay. okay. There will be insufficient positive charge to balance out the negative charge. The lattice is left with one negative net charge. This happens throughout the lattice, and the whole colloid changes that charge. Okay? Does that happen real quickly? It happens instantly. Very rarely are you going to find a clay lattice that, is still, that still has the magnesium in the, in the middle. So the magnesium is completely Replace it, it's now floating around in, in, in the solution, waiting to find something else, because what's the valence of magnesium? It's going to have open ports ready to bond with something else in the solution. Just a water column. A negative two or something. Another negative, yeah, negative two to match up. Is, with. is that? Or two, uh, yeah. So what, I, I've heard that, that oxygen aluminum and iron in clay soil is a bind at phosphorus. This is true. So, is that a result of this? We'll get to that next problem. class. Soil fertility. Come on. Okay. I have a slide for that. Sorry. We're going to have to go. I'm not going to be there. No teaser for you. Yeah, I know. It's bad. It's like a 20 minute explanation. <laughs> this happens throughout the lattice of the whole change in that charge. Okay. Right? Isomorphic substitution. Now we're talking about that radii thing I was talking about. Okay? So this is the, an example of the radii, or at least the number is an example, and the figures are symbolic of the size, right? And if you're in a clay surface, magnesium and aluminum have very similar radii. So there can be that swapping out, yeah? Magnesium, silicon. Kind of similar. I mean, clays can be it, almost any one of those mineral elements, depending on the, the parent material. So isomorphic substitution can happen really between any clay lattice that has those mineral, any one of those soil minerals as a center. But after it's all said and done, the end result is almost always to the point where you get this one taking over the, the, whole, the whole show. So most of them have aluminum in there. Most of them have aluminum in there. So, I mean, it could be magnesium, I'm sorry, it could be uh, uh, sodium, and then the magnesium will take take the spot, and then the aluminum will come in and take the, mag the magnesium. So it could be, you know, any one of the, the mineral solids. I was wondering why we have so much aluminum in our soil. It's a, it's because we have volcanic soils. Oh, okay. So the aluminum and iron, iron being what the center of the earth is primarily made out of, um, and so that's why, it's because they're volcanic soils and they're not, they're, they're not really all that weathered. Okay. Now, if you look at like an oxisol, which is going to be the red, bright red soils you find over Oahu mm -hmm. on the leeward side, the clays, the heavy clays, um, those are red because they have iron and aluminum oxides in them. Mm -hmm. So the more weathered a soil, usually the last thing that's left over is, uh, is aluminum and iron. Everybody gets a similar radii thing? How they can swap out? They're very similar in size. You're not going to have K coming in and knocking out an aluminum or knocking out a magnesium or whatever. It's just too big. Okay? We're going to talk about humus.
hey, we made it through the periodic table together and we learned things. Everybody understands what we just went through. Is there any questions on that whole thing? So the size is related to the number of rings of electrons? <coughs> no. How does it get the size? It's, it's, a, it's a mathematical it's equation to figure yeah. out. It's not a real thing. It's where not a it, real thing. Where does it say the size of the periodic table? It does it it's based upon the atomic weight and other factors. How do we know the size so we can... You don't need to. Because okay. I just told you the end result, <laughs> the end result almost always is, is, is aluminum. Okay. So just know that almost all clay lattices have aluminum in their center, mm -hmm. silica, and on the outside. And aluminum is not that good. Aluminum is toxic to plants. Yeah, so it's bad. Yeah, so humus is the answer? Humus can be the answer. <laughs> of course, because what is the charge of humus can be positive or negative. So now we have the, the stick in the spokes, the, the stopping of this, this cascading yeah. downward. We, we can have a change in the chemistry and start switching um, ions around because now we have a surface that is positively charged. Okay? Humus! Please don't make me say it again. He was, he was being the Very important to all soils, especially in the upper horizons, the O horizon and A horizon. It uh, consists of coal, uh, coal, I colloids all day. Uh, convoluted chains or rings of carbon atoms bonded with hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Example over here, large com uh, humus is a large complex organic humus molecule consisting of chains and rings uh, of mainly carbon and hydrogen atoms. And most of these are a ring, they go all the way around. So they, they're, they're not a line, there's a lot of uh, molecules are like that going in a, in a line or branching off from there. It actually, a lot of times, will come back around complex carbon molecules. Okay? Usually hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. The last things that are left over, small soil colloids, high water holding capacity because of Surface area and waters need to bond with the surface. This is a great tune. I should get you up here doing this. Maybe people will listen. Non cohesive means they usually don't bond with each other. Like clays will bond with each other or go the shrinking and spawning. Generally, they're, they're very independent. SEM image, practically 2,000 times the large of a solid cubic acid. Okay, surface area, right? A little different than the clays. Clays in sheeting convoluted areas. These are literally have more of an organic kind of look to them. Rounded, weathered, chemically changed. Uh, lots of pits and valleys. Lots of surface area, but just a different kind, right, than the clays. The clays are going to be sheeting, and this is just almost looks like coral or something like that, right? <laughs> Decomposition or breakdown of large organic molecules into simpler ones. When a leaf is broken down by a microorganism, the original carbon molecule that that first microbe starts getting onto is a very large complex carbon molecule produced by a plant. The next microbe that comes along has its way with it, bringing it down to a simpler, simpler carbon molecule. Every time a different microbe has its way with it. Okay. When organic tissue is added to aerobic soil, with air, 
Three reactions take place. First thing that happens when a leaf hits the ground or a tree falls down, enzymatic oxidation of carbon compounds to produce carbon dioxide. Okay? These large carbon compounds that are what the leaf is made out of goes through oxidation, adding or remove adding of oxygen. Should I get quoted on you? Uh, enzymatic oxidation uh, releases some of those carbon molecules into the soil atmosphere, which then bond to oxygen molecules and turn into CO2. Or bonded with oxygen molecules actually inside the gut of the, of the microorganisms actually what happens. So the carbon comes in, it doesn't come in the mouth, it gets absorbed, right? bacteria gets absorbed and then inside the gut, it's not a gut, but inside the bacteria, adding oxygen to that, uh, that carbon molecule and expelling the CO2. It's absorbing the carbon because that carbon is bonded with some sort of nutrient source that it wants. So it'll absorb the carbon attached to nitrogen or hydrogen if it needs those. Take those in and the carbon is then added together with some oxygen inside and expelled. Okay? So enzymatic enzymes are the ones that do the oxidation. Those are on the inside or can be done on the outside of the bacteria if it secretes an enzyme that can be done on the outside. Producing carbon dioxide, water, energy, you know, as, as microorganisms consume something, it's going to get energy. Uh, and decom uh, decomposes biomass. It also releases and or uh, immobilizes uh, essential nutrient elements by a series of uh, specific reactions that are unique for each element. So the nitrogen that is in the leaf or the phosphorus that is in the leaf goes through different processes, biological processes, and, um, and each breakdown of those, each one of those molecules is done by a different microorganism or a different, different clade of microorganisms, or a different series of microorganisms. So all microorganisms have essentially a need, a hunger, and it's usually going to be some molecule that they can get from an organic source. For example. Well, ammonia. Okay. NH3 plus? Yeah, NH3 plus. Um, and there's going to be a, a ammonia exists inside plant tissue. Um, and then as soon as it gets released into the environment, there is a microorganism that is waiting for just ammonia, yeah? And then once it gets it, it'll turn that into nitrite. Take it and turn it into nitrite. And then as nitrite exists in the soil, it'll bond with other elements and become nitrate. So as, it basically it changes as you go down and, and that nitrogen is taken out of a very large part of a molecule. Right? So a very large molecule that will come in and take that ammonium that may be bonded with several other carbons and, and oxygens over here, but they'll take the ammonia molecule out of that complex carbon molecule and consume it and do its thing. If there's phosphorus in that complex carbon molecule as well, there is a microorganism waiting for that phosphorus to come into the soil solution so it can have its way with it, consume it, and turn it into something else, poop it out the back, right? Okie doke. Every element has its own pathway. As it goes into the soil, it has its own pathway. Different microorganisms, different things in the soil, consuming it, turning it into different things. And usually this is like a slide. It's like a pathway that all phosphorus take all down the slide. They, they go this way, they go that way, they go that way. Eventually ending up, generally, with plant uptakeable forms of phosphorus. Okay. 
So the release or immobilization of essential nutrient uh, elements by a series of specific reactions that are unique to each element. Does that make sense now? Did I confuse anybody? Please raise your hand if you don't understand what I'm saying. We got time. Okay. The formation of compounds uh, are very resistant to microbial action. Okay. Eventually, these compounds will not be broken down anymore by microbes, and that's when you get humans. So these molecules will trickle down, get chopped away, chopped away, chopped away, and eventually nobody wants to touch it anymore, and that's humans. What is that? It's a carbon <laughs> molecule, usually with uh, hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Okay? Is it quite hardy? Hardy? Yeah, I mean, it must be like salty. Incredibly yeah. hardy. It that's cannot true. be weathered, and it cannot be broken down by, anymore by anything. It was. It will always look like this. It will always be this. Until it's maybe changed by temperature. But for the most part, no microbe wants to have anything to do with it. It's complex uh, carbon molecule chipped away to something more simplistic. Okay? That's what humus is. Where does humus get its charge from? We learned where clay gets its charge from, isomorphic substitution. Where does clay get its charge from? Well, like clay's humus has, humus has a net charge. This is a fact. Unlike clay's, humus varies with net positive and negative charges, typically strong negative charge associated. So most most humus are going to be negatively charged as well, but there is that stick in the smoke that a certain percentage of them are going to be on the positive side. Humus cation with a negative charge grabs a hold of all these positive guys, just like a clay. Varying structures. Um, you asked what is it made of? They said carbon. Oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen in these different um, concentrations. The cation is positively charged. Humus cation negative, humus cation negative charge. I don't know why it says that. That doesn't make sense, does it? It would be a humus cation. Yeah. Hmm, I need to trade today graphic. I didn't write that one myself. Um, okay. Humus anion is a negative charge. Dependent on the amount of hydrogen ions are either lost or gained. It's very pH dependent. So you can change the charge of a humus molecule if the pH is changed enough. And we'll get to that when we do pH. So. Change the and I'll explain how that, that happens. Um, enough positive charges on the outside of a negatively charged molecule, uh, enough hydrogens can change it over. The hydrogens will have a stronger charge than the actual cold. Uniformly like, together. I guess I got a little confused because I thought you were saying humus is what's left after you know everything has been broken down, but then it has this charge and other things are like, attaching to it. To the outside. To the outside, so it's humus plus other stuff, but the humus itself is just like a clay is chipped down as far as away. It's weathered, microbially digested as far as it will go. It will hold those nutrients on the outside. It's not like part of the bond. It's not part of the bond. It's not incorporated into the chemistry. It's actually this molecule is here, that molecule is here, and they're held together by that magnetic force. At no time do their chemistries intermingle. Okay? Where is the H2O? What do you mean? I mean, you said water was connected. It sticks to everything. Right. The water molecule will stick to everything, water molecule being 
Negative. Positively charged. But is it molecularly bonded, or is that? The hydrogen that's in the H2O, H2O, there's two hydrogens sticking off it. H2O? No. 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 Oh, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So, it's been a long day. Yet. H2O. What's the valence of O? Hydrogen is the only uh, only atom that does that. Well, it has to do with the, it, it being a polar bond, right? It's a very high. Right. It's a shield. So no, it's a no, other atom. No, there's a atom that does it. No, they do do that. They share hydrogen molecules all the time. Yeah, but I mean, hydrogen is the only one that is shared. It's because it's a one yeah. by itself. That's why hydrogen is so unique, and that's why it is the major factor in soils. That's why water bonds, wants to bond to itself. It's because it, one of the H's is from another water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's lots of water on the outside of that particle. Right. And it's, they're, they're linked together like this, going all the way, all the way across and so all the way around. all those green hydrogens are probably hooked to, to O's. Probably. Um, yeah. So that's why it was a little bit confusing in that graphic. But, just as easily, this molecule can exist on its own. OH, OH molecule, hydroxyl molecule. Until it finds another hydrogen. Until it finds another hydrogen. Yeah. It will exist in nature. Um, not it, water. Huh? It's, it's not, not water. water. It's hydroxyl. What does that look like? Hydroxyl. Yeah. It's essentially just the oxygen and the hydrogen, what are those two things? They're both gases, right? Okay? So, like plays, blah, 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 varying charges depending on the amount of hydrogen ions are either gained or we left off on pH dependent. Everybody understand what I was talking about there? You asked about where is the water on the outside? usually bonded in through the oxygen or the, or the hydrogen molecule of its configuration. And actually not the oxygen because it's busy with the, the two hydrogen molecules. The, the, we're talking about charge, right? Yeah. <laughs> this hydrogen is jumping back and forth at the speed of light. Between an o, there's an O and an H right here. Okay. And so the water is bonded here with the H, the hydrogen is bonded here with the, with the water. Bouncing back and forth. This one, the water thinks it's got the hydrogen, and this one thinks it's got the hydrogen. But the bonds are different because the water really are, are sort of chemical or atomic bonds, right? Yes. And the other one is just a. Um, it's an electrical charge. charge. Okay. Yes. They're both, uh, they're both really. Ionic bonds. Can they split off 
hydrogen yeah. split off. Split and off from the OH. Yeah. And then the hydrogen goes that way. So imagine if a calcium comes along. There's two H's here. Calcium comes along. It's big. It knocks off that hydrogen. Knocks off this hydrogen. It takes over those two spots. What is left up here floating on its own? The OH just left because it got kicked off of the water molecule. The bond between hydrogen and oxygen is very weak. Very weak. It can come and go. Can you explain it last week, Danny? Depending on the amount of. Next class. Oh. <laughs> We're talking about pH. Next class. We're going pretty heavy into the pH, and you'll understand <coughs> what this is, but I got to keep going. Okay? Hey, that should say, I just found that slide, it should say humus particle negative charge. Humus particle negative charge. So whoever I stole that from, Whoever I stole that from, change it so that it's wrong. <laughs> Humus particle negative charge. Oh, okay. that's, an, that's used as an example of, of cation exchange. Sure. Yeah. Everybody make the change? Sorry about that. Thanks for looking it up. I need a guy like him on my right hand side every time. <laughs> okay. We'll get to the next stuff on the next class, right? Okay, let's go over soil organic matter. We got about an hour, and I'll probably finish up maybe before then. How's that sound? Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> More time for questions. So, soil organic matter, right? Living roots and organisms. Oh, this is all of soil organic matter. Remember that wedge that was on the pie chart? It's 1% of the total, 100%. Uh, microbes is, but soil organic matter is 5% of the total 100%. So this is 100% of the organic material. 50-80% of it is humus. End result of decomposition. 20-45% to 45 is actively decomposing material. So humus is done, right? It's finished decomposing. It's very slowly decomposing. Is it still decomposing, even though it's humus? Soon. No. Not really. Huh? Not really. Okay. Slowly. I mean, a humic particle can. It's all about size. So, if it's less than 0.0000001 um, nanometers across, it's considered humus, and it can continue to break down smaller depending on the parent material. So. Yes, it's still decomposing, but it's, it can be considered humus and still decomposing. The, the criteria for humus is size, not if it's finished decomposing. Does that make sense? But when it gets that size, it's pretty far. Pretty far along. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's almost finished. Okay. okay. Actively decomposing organic material, you have a uh, dead. Dead microorganisms? Dead. <laughs> dead. 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 What does that mean? Dead. That's living that's roots true. and organisms? Okay, dead. that's going to be living roots and organisms and dead yeah. roots and organisms. Oh, I was like, dead. <laughs> Just dead. <laughs> so 50% uh, of the soil organic matter is carbon. So soil organic matter is half carbon. We talked about CN ratio and the natural farming stuff. This comes into play. All organic compo uh, components of the soil uh, is soil organic matter. It includes living biomass, which is plant animal tissues. And of course, dead. Microorganisms, right? Dead and living microorganisms. Living biomass, living microorganisms. <laughs> Dead roots and other unrecognizable plant residues and litter. After a while, these roots and, and, and leaves stop looking like roots and leaves. And that's what they're talking about there. But it's still recognizable. Still recognizable. A uh, largely amorphous, no defined shape, and colloidal mixture of substances no longer recognizable, and that's humus. 
largely amorphous, no defined shape, right? So the clays, generally, depending on their parent material, they have a defined shape. And if you told me the clay name, if I was smart enough, told me the clay name, I should be able to regurgitate what its lattice looks like. Where humus, it's just, I don't know, you're going to have to take a look at it. It could look like anything, amorphous. No defined shape. A colloidal mixture of substances, right in here. But humus is going to be, um, it, it's, it's going to have a lot of those whole carbon rings, right? It's just one of those. The molecule is that. So the shape of the humus is going to be a carbon ring. I mean, a ring. It'd be, yeah, but it's not like a carbon ring of the same, of the same carbon ring. They're not going to look alike because they were decomposed differently at different rates. Even if they're the same parent material, it's not like you're gonna hold them together and you can lay an image of them over each other and they look exactly the same. It's gonna look like that picture I had of the corally type stuff in different configuration. That's what we're saying there. Where the clays, depending if they're the same type of clay, I can maybe lay an image over each other and those octahedral shapes of the lattice will, will be very, very similar. And I can say they look alike, where humus, they, you can't say that any of them are gonna look similar. Genesis of soil organic matter happens through microbial transformations. This is how soil organic matter becomes humus, is because of microbial transformations. Yeah, okay, weathering has a little bit of an effect on breaking down a leaf, but the majority, almost all the magic happens because of microbes. Does it need some water? Yes. Remember that almost all surfaces already have a water layer, so that tends to meet the need of a lot of bacteria. Some fungi don't need the presence of, of like large amounts of water to exist, but they need it to be available for absorption on the surface of the soil. Microbial transformations include decomposition and the production of humic and non-humic substances. Ooh, what is that? Humic substances include 60 to 80 percent of soil organic matter is humic substances. That was that, that side of the pie chart, humus. Large molecules with variable structures aromatic rings, as we mentioned, carbon rings, and generally very dark colored. When I look at them under the SCM, they're, well, the gold doesn't really give us an indication, but there's a gray, uh, a gray uh, scale that we compare it to, and it's a, they're generally very, very dark colored. Why, why is it called humic acids? What's that? Acid. It's, humic acid refers to the the hydrogen that is in the carbon molecule. It's a, the carbon molecule is very acidic because of the amount of hydrogen that's in the complex carbon molecule. Does that make sense? Yes. La large amount of hydrogen is going to indicate that the, the compound is acidic. So that's why it's... Would you tell myself to be aromatic ring? That's the carbon ring? It's the carbon ring. It's the... Okay. It's the compound that has been chiseled away and nobody wants to get at this ring anymore because it's mostly because it's a ring and it's hard to get in to remove uh, any of the, the elements. If it was in a line, you could come in at the ends and have your way with it, but because it's together in a link, it's hard to break in the hoop. So it's stable. It's very stable. Humic substances, pigment, polymers, so uh, folic acids. What am I looking at here? That, whatever. Don't want to confuse anybody. <laughs> Humic substances, as I mentioned, are amorphous. They don't have a distinctive shape where the clays have a distinctive shape. They have a complex diversity because they come from different places. Comes from wood, comes from a leaf, comes from an insect, comes from the hoof of a, of a horse, <laughs> whatever. Comes from so many different places. 
So you're going to have very complex diversity, organic materials most resistant to microbial attack. Like I said, microbes don't even want to have their way with it anymore. It's done. It's finished. Stick a fork in it. It's done. They don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. It, of course, has high water holding capacity and high cation holding capacity if it is negatively charged, which most of them are. Compost is highly humid. Highly humid, correct. Mm -hmm. Unless you take blue rock or something in there and add it to it, it's almost primarily humid. Which is why you don't grow in, in compost alone. You need to have that rock element. So when you go to soil analysis measuring cation ion exchange capacity, you're really measuring the, the humic and and, and the clay. Of, of, oh yeah, I guess. It's really how many negatively charged colloids do you have. And that is important because most plant nutrients are positively charged. So that's why the cation exchange capacity is important. Because it tells you how well your soil holds on to these nutrients that plants want. Okay, so we have uh, root exudates. So oh, we're getting into the next class. Actually, we're getting into... I think the class after that. <laughs> Roots. Let me show you a diagram of a typical root. And I think I did this in the first class. Root hair. charge on the outside of roots. This is what a typical root looks like. The plants have put the hydrogen molecules there to substitute for any nutrients that have appeared and then they absorb it. Say the plant absorbs some nitrogen. Nitrogen Nitrogen goes in. That spot needs to be replaced with something after the nitrogen goes in. And so the plant puts a hydrogen molecule there. Because it needs to have something there. And it's not going to just let anything from nature just kind of come up to the, to, the, to the root here. It wants something. It knows what it is. It wants something that is easily exchangeable and not too strong of an electric charge. So it puts hydrogen on the outside of the root. Once this is absorbed, it goes back to keeps its options open. Keeps its options open. So the, the absorption process is <clears throat> releasing the hydrogens. Putting the hydrogen out and pulling the other one in. How do I how do I receive a three plus ion and knock off three hydrogens? And that three plus then comes to my three minuses here and I absorb it. Once it's absorbed into the root, I put a hydrogen there to take those ports. And then that's in the vasculatory system? And then it goes into the root system and up to the vasculatory system. Okay, so. Plants affect what? Hydrogen. So, if you have a plant in a pot, and you take a pH reading of the soil pH, and it's 6.3. And then, it's a tomato plant, and you just water it, and you water it, and you water it. You're growing a nice tomato plant, everything's fine. But you don't put any amendments in there. You're just watering, watering, watering. It consumes all of its nitrogen that's in there, and released all the hydrogens out into the environment. And now there's no nitrogen on the colloid surfaces anymore. All of these hydrogens get released by the plant, go to the colloid surface. Before you know it, all the colloids have hydrogens all over it. And we do a pH reading. And in the pH, of course, gets more acidic. And so a lower pH. 
Plants have a direct effect on the pH of the soil because of their release of hydrogen into the environment. When it absorbs something, it uses something that's, it's currency, it's energy currency. It takes in three bucks, puts out three bucks. It takes in two bucks, puts out two bucks. In dollar bills. Because dollar bills are easier <laughs> to get rid of than acquire, you know, than putting a three out. Well, hydrogen is the currency. Yeah, hydrogen is the currency. Um, and so is the, the, uh, the elements that come in. The three plus, plus that comes in is worth three bucks. The hydrogen is worth a dollar each. So it puts out three singles on the outside after it took in the three. It's a currency, it's an energy exchange. Okay, so I just got on a rant there about the next few classes here. So, root exudates, they release hydrogen ion atoms uh, onto the colloid surfaces, as I just mentioned. These hydrogen uh, ions swap for cations. If there's enough hydrogens floating around in the solution and there's one lonely calcium on the side of a colloid and there's just hydrogens all around it, something called mass action that will make the overall charge of all of those hydrogens kick off that two calcium, kick it off. It's too much of a charge in competition with the singles that are out there, right? So. You know, you ever watch a, like a lizard getting eaten by an ant? It's kind of like that kind of concept, right? It's just the overall in numbers, it can't handle it. It's too much a bombardment of this charge. It goes, ah, it just takes off electronically. Your charge, it gets pushed off. So all those hydrogen atoms can push off that calcium. So all of a sudden, now this negatively charged colloid surface is kind of, covered completely in hydrogen because of the plant. What happens to this calcium, sodium, magnesium, iron? What happens to this after it gets kicked off? It goes into the water that's around the colloids. What happens if it rains that night? Gone. They're no longer in the equation. Now all you have is hydrogens coming off your plants and stuck to your colloids. There's nothing else there. Not until you take nitrogen and add a fertilizer and you offset that balance, not balance, but that dominance of hydrogen. We're getting into soil fertility next time. This is what we're talking about. Okay? Did I lose anybody there? Of course I did. What are non-humic substances? This is the other side of the pie chart that's not humus. Clay. Two. This is coming from an organic source. Right? Organic material gets broken down. I'm just saying, organic material alone, if you just take the organic material out of the soil, that's what we're talking about. Soil organic material. 20 to 30 percent of that is non human. Okay? Means these, these elements are less complex, less resilient to microbial attack. Much simpler. Think of it this way. Large molecule being the uh, human, humus. And when a microbe comes along and right before, right before this becomes the finished product of humus, one more microbe comes in and takes off one little piece of it. And that's what we're talking about. This is a non-humic substance, right? This is, the humus is here. Eventually, you, the microbes come in, they chip away all the non-humic substances. You're much less complex. So it's not this giant ring. It's this little carbon molecule on the side that gets lost. And then after it gets lost, you can say, it doesn't want to break down anymore after that. But either way, that last piece that came off, is a non-humic substance. It's not humus, the ring, it's a piece that got broken off during decomposition. Does everybody understand that? Yes? I don't know what it is yet. Okay. <laughs> you understand the concept I just talked about? Okay. Less complex, these are less resilient to microbial attacks, so that piece that got chopped off then is the, like Doritos, just, they just start eating it up. Microbially modified plant compounds. 
So these are going to be um, usually like uh, saps and phytochemicals produced by plants. Phytochemical, plant chemical. Um, microbially modified, well it came out the plant, a molecule of sap, and it has been microbially broken down until it's a non-humic substance. More simpler compounds, influence availability of plant nutrients. Most of the times that piece that gets chopped off usually has a plant nutrient somewhere in there. It's chopped off, the plant nutrient is now available to plants in the water solution. That's why you get large amounts of nutrition from or soil organic matter. You get large amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium from this material as opposed to rock, right? Just because there's more of it in there originally, so you get more plant nutrients from the breakdown of humans. Some directly uh, affect plant growth. I mean, some of them, the pieces that get chopped off are just, like I said, plant obtainable molecules. Taken off and it instantly gets taken up into the plant and used. Okay. An example of non-humic substance would be cellulose. Cellulose is what cell walls are made out of in plants. Okay. So that would be broken off a more complex carbon molecule and then consumed by microbes. But as it exists in the snapshot of the soil sample we have, microbes haven't eaten it yet. So it exists as a non-humic substance. Okay. Everybody get that? Much simpler. Not a giant ring. That's in the partially broken down state. This is as it's going down to humus. These things come okay. off of the molecule that eventually will be humus. Okay. There's a piece of it here gets taken off. Piece of it here gets taken off. Eventually, no more pieces can get taken off, and then that's humus. But in the soil ring, uh, it's it's the it's the ten percent or whatever that is not not finished breaking down yet. Right, right, to the right of dead. Yeah. Right? The other side of dead. Minerals come from rocks. Yeah. This is coming from plant material. There is zero minerals in here. Zero. But, remember how I said that basketball? So clays are usually laden with, with these, and then it becomes a little bit different equation. Right? Okay, moving on. Almost there, guys. Wow. How does clay and humus generally exist in nature? I was just talking about that. Most of the time, clays and humus live in combination like this, in an aggregate. They live together in harmony, stuck together by charge. You gotta know that if there is a positively charged uh, humus molecule out there, it's getting sucked into the side of a negatively charged clay, or a negatively charged um, humus. Don't think of these things as little particles floating around by themselves. I talked about this last class. These things are always bunched together in groups of different sizes and different decomposition rates held together by electronic charge as well as ionic charge as well as a microbial blues and stickies. So always think of these things as an aggregate, never by themselves. These combinations stabilize organic matter and nitrogen. Mainly because nitrogen being Positive, typically positively charged. Um, nitrogen in the, in the soil solution is usually bonded right away with this combination, the soil and, uh, and, and uh, the clays and uh, humus. Okay, so if there's any nitrogen in the soil, it's going right there. And then it can be changed, broken down, and then released into the soil environment where plants can take them up. 
And when you do fertilizer, yeah, typically the plant will take up a certain percentage when it doesn't need tonight. The rest of the nitrogen bonds with clays. And then if it rains that night, they all go away. <laughs> Soil organic matter is entrapped in the clay micropores. Remember how I said that basketball and like talcum powder, like flour? So if it, the, the, the basketball has pits and valleys and all the surface area in there, these microorganisms um, get trapped inside those pits and valleys. Okay. They're impervious to microbial attack once they're in there. So if a humic substance is not quite finished, if it gets in that hole, it's done. There ain't no more microbes breaking it down. What's that so on? Soil organic matter. So then whatever's attached to it is also not available to the plant. True. Paleontologists are currently looking at these organic compounds as a time capsule. This is awesome study, just a side note. Soil scientists are loving this. They're finding, there's, there's PhDs out there that are going into a, a clay colloid, going into the little niches and valleys, pulling out soil, or the, uh, my words are all done, the humus, and then analyzing where did this come, what was the parent material? They could find out what the parent material was, how long ago it was there. You could find out what the composition of an area was a million years ago, 10 million years ago, because the parent material is on the inside of those place like a time capsule. Nothing can break it down. It sits there waiting for a doctor to come along and take it. Okie doke. Find that study, it's very impressive. Indirect influence of soil organic matter in soil. Okay, relax your brain. We're done thinking very hard. We're just getting into this part and we're all finished. Soil physical properties include, we talked about last class, color, um, granulation or aggregation is what I like to call it. Uh, well, okay, do I get deeper into this? Probably not. Yeah. No, okay. We talked about it in the last class. What does dark color indicate? Yeah, you do. So I, I go deeper? Okay. Well, I have three more slides. Okay, and it talks about color and all that? Um, you have an indirect influence of soil organic matter on soil. We have a little blue diagram maybe or something? No, you don't really talk about it. I don't? Okay, I'm going to talk about it here. Co color. Soil organic matter. Color is a good indication of how much soil organic matter there is. In the last class we learned that the darker the color, the more soil organic matter there is, the more humic substance. Remember I said humic is very dark colored, which is why you have the dark color in soil. Which is why in that zone of leaching, you have very white or yellowy colored material because there is no humus in there. It affects the aggregation both by its charge and its ability to hold microorganisms in it, which exit, uh, which expel sticky stuff. It causes more aggregation. So because there's so many microbes in the humic substance, or pretty much in, in the soil organic matter, um, did I lose you? I'm sorry, my words. <laughs> I'm trying to miss like a 10th hour on this. Are you confused on that? Did I finish my statement? No, that's good. You talked about color and granulation. I'm now on granul granulation and aggregation. Okay. So because, <laughs> because they have so many microorganisms living on their surface, it, they're very sticky. Okay? But, but and a charge. They have a charge as well, which will cause the bonding. But that, that aggregation is not what we normally know of as stickiness in soil. No, no. That's no. Clay. Stickiness in soil is actually through the pressure of water and the clay surface. Mm -hmm. So the more clay you have, the more sticky the soil is. And that's because you're actually um, pushing the water layer of the clay together, <coughs> causing okay. stickiness. Okay? So we're down to reduce, it, uh, reduce stickiness and cohesion of soils. Soil organic matter will, if you, have, if you have clay soils, like you're talking about the stickiness, if you have clay soils, add soil organic matter, it'll aerate and open up those soils. 
Um, it improves soil water holding retention. Why? Surface area. The surface area and plus microbes alone hold a lot of water in their bodies. Okay, so with soil organomatter comes a lot of microbes, which means they are holding a lot of water to do their thing. And when they die, that water is available. Soil organic matter is, is not just humans, it's, it's still decomposing. Yes, correct, still decomposing. Humic particles. Okay, uh, and improves water holding retention, right. Indirect influence of soil, soil chemical properties, right? So we just looked at the physical, let's look at the chemical properties. What effect does soil organic matter have on the chemical properties? Well, 15 to 90% cation absorbing power of surface soils comes from soil organic matter. Do you have a CEC rating, cation exchange uh, rate rating? that you get from your soil analysis. If you were to spend the next three months putting soil organic matter out, your CEC would go way up. Okay. 15 to 90% so, uh, cation absorbing power of the surface soil is because of soil organic matter. So if your surface soil is mostly clay, your surface soil is not absorbing any nutrients because it needs the soil organic matter to absorb those nutrients. A lot of people that have like coffee and then like lawn right up to the coffee and it's like, or pretty much any orchard, um, to think that when you put out fertilizers at the base of your grass, to think that those fertilizers are going to bond to anything in that soil is naive unless you have lots of soil organic matter around the base of the tree. And I'm not just talking like grass. I'm talking wood, things that include, that have wood in them because wood attracts fungi, which actually breaks up the soil a lot better than bacteria does. So every one of your trees, no matter what your tree is, should have a four foot to six foot ring of mulch, four inches high, all the way around the base of the tree, every tree, no care what it is. It has drip, drip ring, right? It's just mulch. No, but that, yeah. that, 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 it should be at the tree drip line. Oh, it could, well, I would say if this is your tree, like it's coffee tree, mm -hmm. I'd say a six foot ring all the way around it of Which is beyond four to six inches. Nah. Oh, the the, the, the lateral roots on coffee can go out 10, 11. Feet. That goes all the way into all, almost touches the trunk, doesn't touch the trunk, but that's what you're saying. It goes oh, really? all the way up to the trunk. Oh, okay. Okay, oh, really? that was one of my big questions. Better to have it thick or none at all? Have it thick, but you don't want the, the you don't want the decomposition happening right on the truck. Yeah. No, you want to have I didn't mean to confuse you. Yeah. You want like a little ring of, of space right. between well, the truck. I think trunk. what they were talking about is do you need a ring, just a ring. Not a, a plastic line. ring. Or, 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 no, they, they thought you meant like a ring at the drip line, a narrow band. And you were talking oh. about a thick like pillow, a spit, thick circular pillow that goes six feet around mm -hmm. at okay. the base of the tree. And then once that layer is decomposed down to about two inches, you add more. Uh, so it should, woody stuff is good? Or should woody stuff is definitely good because the only thing in nature that can break down wood is a fungi. Uh -huh. And so if you have woody stuff, you're going to have fungi. Yeah. And you're going to have a little bit more of the breaking up of the, the, the soil. And you're going to have absorption of the nutrients you're laying down. The nutrients will go right into that mulch and be processed by microorganisms and then eventually leach down into the soils, uh, soil zone and then taken up by plants. If you're taking fertilizer or granular and throwing it at the base of your plant and walking by, I can tell you about 2% of that material gets into the soil. Forget getting into the plant. Just condensation alone, sunshine and heat, will cause your nitrogen that you're laying out to go turn into gas right away. So I love this look because most people are always doing it wrong. Did you think that going like this, like Johnny Appleseed was gonna do something? No. 
<laughs> I am blessing the ground with my love. No, you're not. You're causing problems in our atmosphere. No, so that, that atmospheric change doesn't happen even if you spread it on mulch. Okay, if you put the nitrogen down, you put your granular down, and then you mulch on top, ah, right. uh, you don't get that loss. All right. All right. Yeah. Not only that, but most nitrogen fertilizer you put out are ammonia-based, mm -hmm. and it needs to be transferred from ammonia to nitrate to nitrate before it can be taken up by a plant. Oh, so it has to be broken down. It has to be broken down. It, nitrate was available for a hundred years to every farmer on the planet until Oklahoma City. Oh. <laughs> and that moron made it so that we can now not access it. I can get it, because I have lab access and I can order it. <laughs> but you have to be a lab tech, you have to you know, have a get it through laboratory in order to get it nowadays. So, we used to have a fertilizer that you could just... <laughs> we don't have that anymore, it's not available to us. Which is better, because it causes you to use soil organic better, which is better for your plant. Okay, here we go. Okay. Infl indirect influence of soil organic better, it holds nutrients near the plant roots. As I said, it's going to be like that cation exchange capacity model that's just going to sit there and absorb those nutrients right near the root zone. Provides a majority of pH buffering. Microbes like pH to be at a certain pH, 6.0 or 6.2 to 7 typically. So they will create a pH environment that is conducive for them. They will change the pH of the environment so that they so that it's great for them. So if you put all your nutrients up in the soil organic matter near the top, um, you're going to be laying your nutrients into a very buffered, pH buffered area. Where your soil organic matter ring around your tree, the first inch or two of soil that's beneath that might be a pH of about 6.6. .6, where every bit of soil that's not included in that part might be a 5. <coughs> Why? Because the microbes that are in that soil zone have made a pH more conducive for them in decomposition. So if you have lots of soil organic matter in your soil, you're never going to have a pH issue. If you have a 5.5 pH right now in your soil reading, put some organic matter around your trees. Humic acids chemically break down soil minerals. The acids themselves have a reaction to soil minerals because there is because of their chemical properties and their, the, their level of pH, death can break bonds of other molecules, releasing certain nutrients into the environment where they wasn't available before. Humic acids accelerate decomposition. So when I put out IMO4 into my compost pile, and then next to it I have a compost pile I don't put IMO4, IMO4 being laden with beneficial bacteria and fungi, the one on the, the, one on the left is going to break down much, much faster than the one on the right, because it has more microbial presence, causing more production of humic substances, which then makes more area for microorganisms to live in and they're on, causing this kind of downward slope of the decomposition, more and more decomposition. The more a microbe decomposes soil organic material, it makes more houses for more microbes and makes better area for more microbes, which then they reproduce and fill and so you get faster decomposition. Question? <laughs> It's not about that, it's about something in the far back. Maybe it's at the end. Okay, you let me know. Everybody understands that plants, plant roots, don't touch the colloids, right? Plant roots, they stick out into soil solution, which is the water in the soil. They don't even touch. Soil. Yeah. 
negatively charged, right here, right? Usually the, the roots are going to be negatively charged. Organic matter is not totally broken down into a humic substance yet, so this, the organic matter will actually have varying charges throughout its structure. So if it's not humus yet, it could be positive on one side, negative on another, you know, dispersed throughout. <clears throat> a lot of, a lot of um, humus are like that, actually, that they have a general negative charge, but there's small ports on it that are positively charged. But I want you to understand that soil organic matter versus a colloid, soil organic matter would be varying charges all throughout because it's it's not finished yet can still hold molecules I mean atoms just like a colloid can and it can hold negatives and positives because it has those ports but once it's broken down into humus it's usually negatively net charged see the difference from this to this mm -hmm. This whole thing is, that's plant fertility. That's in three classes. Two classes. <laughs> well, that, that was my question. How do you get a positively charged humus? How do you get positively charged humus? Well, depending on its paired material, it might just be generally positively charged because of the paired material. But we don't have that around here. We do. The humus is either positively or negatively charged. Everywhere in the world, it's the clays here that are generally negative in almost everywhere. Okay? So the clay and the, the humus really just are conduits for the nutrients. Yes. Yes. They are. Nope. They hold on to the nutrients, release them into the solution, and then the plants remove the hydrogen molecules to receive the charge of the nutrient. They recognize that there is a ammonia molecule, high amounts of ammonia molecules in the soil. They will just release all of the hydrogen off of their root hair. And then wait for all of those threes to come in. Advanced Soil Science, we did it guys, we went over introduction to the soil review, properties of the colloid fraction, it's so funny, the next couple classes I get, like my outlines are turning into two and three, just things that all I'm going to talk about for four hours is two and three. Uh, properties of colloidal fraction, we talked about humus, what it is, why it's important, what it's charges, uh, and then the uh, organic matter. This was the big one, guys, properties of the colloidal fraction, because this comes into play during soil fertility and plant fertility, as you can see. So how does a plant take up a nutrient? Oh, we'll talk about that. But first, we have to talk about roots, and we have to talk about stems, and xylem, and phloem, and how plants move juices and water throughout its system. You've got to introduce the plant before we get into how plants take up roots or take up uh, nutrients, okay? So, next class. Talk about soil fertility, guys. Wrapping up all the soil stuff into one wonderful presentation, which talks about soil pH. We're gonna talk a little bit about nutrient cycling, how nutrients move throughout the environment. They turn into gases, get absorbed, get brought back into the soil, get brought into gases and all around, right? Uh, plant nutrient availability, how many ions are available for plants to take up? When we're talking about how phosphorus gets locked up into, into our clay soils, you could, you could be putting phosphorus all day in your, in your soil, but if the, if the soil is absorbing the phosphorus and holding it, then it's not available to plants. So in Hawaii, you actually sometimes have to add 500 to 1,000 times as much phosphorus as you do on the mainland because of our soils. Because 99% of that gets absorbed into the soil. How much does phosphorus fertilizer cost? It's not cheap. 
it's also not renewable. Most of the time, it's not, not renewable. Well, soil, like rock phosphate. It's rock phosphate. It's 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 sea kelp and ogo that you go down to the beach and pull out yourself. But high in phosphorus. But the soil has, has plenty of phosphorus. You would you add organic matter. It, it will. Tends to release it. Right. It, tends, it tends to be, it doesn't hold as much. Your soils are your soils. They are organic soils. They will hold a very large per percentage of the phosphorus in the soil, no matter what you do. All you can do is add soil organic matter to offset a little bit of the balance, and then just add phosphorus until you meet that buffering zone. We'll talk about buffering zones and all that in the next class. Hey, look, it's buffering. We'll talk about soil remediation how to change a soil to be the way you want it to be. And then we'll get into uh, several fertilizers. Just general stuff about fertilizers, what's on the outside of the label and all that good stuff. But the most important part is going to be on pH, of course. Why is pH important? Hey, a little introduction to next class. Here we have the viability of elements to plant at different pH levels for mineral soils. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, copper, and it's not all of them. But, in this little window right about here, pH 6.0 to 7.0, plants generally absorb the most concentration of, of minerals. That's why pH is important. If your pH is 5.5, your plants are able to absorb this level of the nutrients that you're putting out, a small percentage. If you're in the five range, Hamakua Coast, unattended old cane, <coughs> sure, you're getting an awful lot of iron and manganese, which can be toxic, 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 toxic at high levels. So if your pH is at five, and you're getting really sick plants and you can't figure out why. You do a nutrient analysis and it's like there's so much available manganese or copper in the soil. Then you know, whoa, it's very obvious what's going on here. Bring your pH up to 6.5 and you have a lot more absorption and you don't have the toxicity levels over here. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it all together. Okay, so for the next class we're going to go over that and all of these things over here. In soil remediation, we're going to talk about it all, things like coral, king lands, arsenic. That, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about um, um, complex carbon molecules, soil organic matter. Okay, the microbes, they know how to break down that stuff. Okay, We use microbes to clean up oil spills and all that stuff. The, um, the fumigants and all that stuff that's, that's still in the soil, methyl bromide and all that stuff. If you have, there is a microorganism in your soil organic matter, that will break down that, that molecule. And arsenic is one of those things. Yes. You just have to have enough soil organic matter over a long period of time to break down that complex molecule that is the methyl bromide molecule to something more doable. So we'll talk about liming and all that stuff in the soil remediation. That's the main part of, of what I'm talking about in soil remediation is bringing the pH up. So I talk about what happens when you put calcium in the soil. It has a lot to do with ionic charge. Knocking off hydrogens, replacing it with calcium. Not from getting from it, you don't want to get it from an animal source? Or a plant? A plant source? Seaweed? Fish? Nice. It's an animal. It's an animal. Why don't you want to use animal products? I'm a vegan. You're a vegan, but the microbes aren't. <laughs> well, okay, you want to be a vegan. I get that. But if it's a byproduct, do you still feel you're having something to do with it? If it's going to be thrown in a garbage can? So if I was going to take bones and throw them away, I would bury them. <laughs> okay, that's it. It's interesting because I'm a nutrient junkie. Like to me, like I'm a fertility 
junkie. I look out in, in nature and in urban environments and all these places and I'm like, nutrient source! Nutrient source, nutrient source. I see, I see that, but I don't want to be a part of it. You know? And I go for the most, of, I just go for the most efficient, like you get the most concentration from, from those materials, so that's why I use it. If there was a higher concentration in a plant, then I would probably use it. You know what? I would use bones if they were allowing me to use legs of being amputated and things like that. that <laughs> that's interesting. That's crazy, I know, but I would soon people would give them That's a great market. What do they do with the legs they cut off? They put them in the landfill. Do they really? Yeah. <laughs> right. I have a question. Diabetes patients. If that was a role like that, was, huh? uh, was, 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 was that question for the whole thing of dynamic accumulators, bloom plants like Humphrey and burdocks and eggplant, which accumulate from the soil levels, uh, calcium and all phosphorus. Bringing it up from levels, bringing it into the, the plant structure, and then using the plant structure as an yeah. old yeah. I'm sure there's a great science behind that. So, kelp is your, is the I'm saying locally available kelp. Are, yeah. There, there are plants which are dynamic accumulators of calcium. And if you just take your lawn clippings, or you take plant clippings, mm -hmm. and you chop them up and maciate them, and you put them in a big 55-gallon drum of water, put them all in there overnight for two night or two, mm -hmm. filter out all the stuff. That water is going to be laden with all the phosphorus that was in that was in the plant, and you just put it right back out of the field. So if you've been mowing along and throwing away your, your chippings or even just putting them on the ground, no, gather them up, put them in. That's a great way to get phosphorus. Take them right out of the next plant. I mow it into the trees. When I mow, I mow around the tree and mow yes, all the I'm stuff into the tree. Yeah. But it's that it's wet, that so what happens then is yeah. that, that phosphorus gets taken up by a microorganism way before and consumed and gone way before it gets given to the plant. Yeah, that's what it's so so making it more soluble. Yeah. So rake, once you cut it, rake no. it up, throw it in a, in a tub. Yeah. Water on it. Put it into the water so that that phosphorus can then penetrate the soil's uh, media uh -huh. and go right up to the, the plant root and be absorbed. Uh, what? There's some calcium though, is it? What's that? Phosphorus. I'm talking about what, what can you use for calcium? What's your calcium? Oh, you want calcium? Yeah, to, to raise the pH. Coral? That's Crushed what, coral? Yeah. That's what, we, that's what everybody in Hawaii uses. uses. Yeah. Corals are plants. Question? I'm, gonna, I'm, well, I'm taking that grass, those grass clippings and mixing them with carbon in a compost pile. I'm sorry, I was listening to you. What? You start over. I, I'm taking that those grass clippings and mixing them with carbon in a compost pile. Okay. And and, and the there, microbes are eating your phosphorus. And 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 I'm not. My plants aren't getting it. Oh, <laughs> Next class, I'm going to show you why phosphorus is such a goofy thing. It's in, it exists in so many forms in the soil and only be, can be taken up by a plant in one or two forms. One or two forms. So it's so many ways it can exist and it cannot be taken up by a plant unless it's bonded with, don't quote me on this until I get to the slide, but I think it's O and H. Well, can I take, uh, can I put it in the water and take it out and then put the grass clippings on the compost pile? You want to do what again? Sorry. Oh, well, can I can I take the phosphorus out, put it in the water, uh -huh. so I'm I'm able to spray that back, yeah. and then take the grass clippings and put them on the compost pile? Yes. Now you're putting carbon, a little bit of nitrogen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's easy. <laughs> it doesn't take long. You just put it in a bed and you let it sit overnight. This is the one that's in the green grass. I didn't think about that. I don't think phosphorus. Is it only in the green grass? It's only in living cells are you going to be able to extract it that way. Because what happens is the grass has a vein and it's a monocat. So all of the, the, the cells go in one direction. So if you chop the end of it off and the water starts through osmotic pressure, starts pulling. Is it in sand grass? Yep. You can use any kind of grass. Just watch your seeds. How long will the phosphorus stay in solution? Um, it doesn't volatize, it's pretty much there for... Yeah. But what happens, as soon as you put it in the soil, most of it gets taken up by microbes. All you're trying to do is get some of, a small percentage of that liquid to the outside of the root of your tree so it can absorb that right now. After that moment, consumed, 
taken up, washed away. That's the, that's the fate of it. So you don't do foliar? foliar. You don't do foliar. Okay, no. foliar. Yeah. Not only that, but if you're doing foliar with that kind of thing, you might be passing some pathogens around. Because oh. you're taking a leaf surface and then putting that directly to another leaf surface. Now, if you're taking the leaf surface stuff and putting it directly into the soil, a lot less chance you have a pathogen issue. Any other questions? Is everybody excited for next class? And, and next Saturday. Next Saturday. Do you, um, do you have a, a source you recommend if we wanted to review this in another form? I'll bring it. I'm going to show you a book I want you to buy. I'll bring it next class. <laughs> Okay, but then we can't review before next. Ah, yes. Um, let me Google and see if I can find the title. <laughs> and you have a, a website you were referring to that the natural farming stuff is on your Website or is a school website or? Website? I don't have a website. There isn't one, but those forms are available online through CTAR. Oh, website. Oh, sure. Okay. Hmm. I'm gonna find it. Okay. Probably not. But. <laughs> How about this? Tonight, when you get home, you email me. When I get home, I'll look at the title and I'll send you back the title of the book. All right. It's a soil textbook that there's the version I'm going to tell you, which is this thing, and then it's based upon the version which is this <laughs> thing. I don't know which route you want to go. I went for the bigger one originally, and then I left it on an airplane oh. studying soil. It was a theater to deal with. And then I'm just going, nah, because I had a final like the next day. Oh my god. And then I went and or, uh, to the bookstore and got the one they wanted for class. Yeah. But this soils book that I have is the one that's used at uh, UIC, UH Manoa, I'm not UIC, UC Davis, Cornell. This is the one that everybody uses. So I'll get you the title. All you got to do is email me at J R U S H I N G, J Rushing at hawaii.edu. Send that over to me tonight, and within the next 48 hours, I'll do my best to uh, get it's you that. Yep, hawaii.edu.com. Can I make sure I have the evaluations filled out and left for me face down on that table over there? Does anybody need some? Yeah, there's a PDF that you can order that you can get on and just look at the Anybody else? Did you guys get this? Do you need this? There's a there's like a, a, a chart. It's just not calcium. It's all the things, but there's certain I things. Like these speakers. I thought I had comfrey a and dandelion. And get on your way. We need that plant finish. Big ones for calcium are comfrey, dandelion, uh, calcium. Adults. Everybody sign this, right? Stinging nettles yeah. and Thank you. parsley. Parsley and watercress. All big for cows. Yeah, you total of nine weeks for a second. I can send this to you. Can you um, email me that? Yeah, what is your email? To yeah. Also, folks, go ahead. Before you take off? My baby, listen up folks, my baby's due date is September 4th, okay? We have classes scheduled during that time, okay? So, if it happens that my baby's born, what we'll do is push back the schedule of the week so that we can keep on track. Did I say that? Yes. <laughs> that was bad. Yikes! Well, he's, he's almost here. He's about four weeks away. So, um, so uh, the way it's going to work is I think the way that we should do it, because you can't really have the next class without the one before, yeah. that I think we should just we'll cancel, I'll let everybody know, and if you can't make it on the succeeding ones, we'll, we'll do refund and all that stuff. But September 4th is right in there. What classes are right then? Uh, September 6th. 6th, okay. 
What's the class that day? Soil microorganisms. Soil microbes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely you guys want to see that. And it's near yeah. the end. So there might be what, one or two more or three more? Yeah, two more. Two more after that. Okay. So it wouldn't be that big of a deal, you know, if we canceled and pushed it down. And not only that, if you stop coming like after that, you got a whole lot of education on those those front seven classes. Okay. Yeah. For some reason I can't Sure. So uh, the, the title is Nature yeah, and Nutrients. You let us know early enough that we can go and pay for. I gotta go and read. I literally, if my if my wife goes, oh, I'm telling Debbie, <laughs> who is just here, and she's gonna handle all of it. She's gonna contact you and let you know what the deal is and when we're rescheduling and all that stuff. Okay. Okay. And in this classroom. We're gonna continue to meet in this classroom. Sorry about all the confusion. It's better. They tend to. Yeah. The bathrooms are actually open. Yeah. So it's closed. And dynamic accumulators. Yeah, it's so cool. The other one is called dynamic accumulators of nutrients for compost. Oh, yeah. Oh. Which is just a simple chart like this. Okay.